798 AD, the Viking menace swept onto the Isle of Man in the Irish Sea, about 50 miles off the coast of Western Britain, and started the story of this remarkable seafaring nation. At Peel, they burnt the monastery on St. Patrick's Isle to the ground, and all the earliest records of Manx history were lost. From this time, people constantly lived in fear for their lives. But eventually the Vikings settled on the island, bringing their ways and customs. They met to dispute matters and proclaim their laws at Tynwald, the Viking Parliament, the oldest parliament in the world, which still meets to this day on exactly the same spot. By marrying the local chieftain's daughters, the Vikings acquired all the land in Man and adopted Christian customs. This year, after an 18-year gap, the Isle of Man celebrated its unique history with a stunning Viking festival. Locals and visitors from around Britain were treated to reenactments of famous battles. It's been slightly interesting because, of course, this is a revival of an event that first happened back in 1961. So it's been fondly remembered in folklore, and just like the Viking sagas, everyone remembers these dramatic pageants on the beach. But this little island here controlled the Irish Sea and it's got 400 years of really important history. We're very proud of our uh, Viking uh, heritage. I think it's one of those events that whilst it is very spectacular while they're watching, it's uh, probably one of these things that uh, they will be thinking about for days and weeks to come. They've seen an awful lot of activity, an awful lot to take in, but that is the, the, the beauty of, of an event like this. You can live with the memories for quite some time. the events recreated was a magnificent Viking sea burial reserved for Viking chieftains. Vikings believed that when they died their god Odin called them to Valhalla, to the Hall of the Slain, to fight and drink again as warriors in the afterlife. Despite their fearsome reputation, Vikings are still a bit of a mystery. Driven by population growth, competition for farmland and ambitious leaders, Vikings colonised large parts of Britain, including the North West. They came to Wirral because they had permission from the then Queen of the English, Queen Ethelfled, to settle in these lands which were then considered of low value, marshy land which the English didn't really want. So the Queen of the English gave them permission to settle here on condition that they basically behave themselves and didn't start uh, attacking the, the surrounding English. During the Victorian era, storms and high tides battered the coastline. Between five and 8,000 objects from prehistoric through to medieval times were found on the beach, making Mells one of the most significant ancient sites in the northwest of England. Vikings have influenced hundreds of place names all over Lancashire and Merseyside. For example, Tranmere, which has the only football team in the English league with a Norwegian Viking name. Place names which end in Kirk, like Ormskirk, and B, such as Crosby or Kirby, also have strong Scandinavian influences. We're here in a suburban part of West Kirby at the Church of St Bridget's. What on earth has that got to do with the Vikings? Well, there's something very special inside. So mark the hotbacks just in the corner. Over in the far Over side there. of the church. Yeah. Oh gosh, you can just about make it out. Let's go and have a look. It wasn't there originally, of course. It was originally on the uh, side of a grave. Right. Somebody important. Wow, that's absolutely enormous. This looks to be in remarkably good condition. Six years ago, it was beautifully restored by the, the Merseyside Conservation Centre. And of course, it's not like it was originally. It's, it's suffered a lot of uh, erosion mm. uh, over the years. We think it was, uh, it was constructed somewhere in the region of uh, 1000 AD. These are quite important in that these are 
a hallmark of Viking settlement, aren't they? That's right. Someone remarked that the, the hogback is a monument to uh, Viking colonialism. So it's a very important status symbol. And the other interesting thing, of course, is when they, uh, they came over from, from Ireland, uh, many of them have become Christian. And it's possibly the biggest lost treasure we've found so far because it's in, in, in a modern environment here. We're in a, a relatively new church in a relatively modern housing estate here, aren't we? I noticed as we drove in, um, it's not the sort of place you would expect perhaps to find something like this. That's right, and of course many of the locals don't realise what sort of treasure they, 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 they have here. People don't even realise it's here. Uh, on their doorstep. Viking communities grew up in North Wirral and Saxons in the south appeared to tolerate their Scandinavian neighbours. That situation changed dramatically in the summer of 937 AD when a great Viking army from Dublin threatened the peace by pillaging English towns. The Wirral name of Thingwall, the site of the Viking Parliament or Thing, is possibly the place where the peaceful local Viking community discussed the coming onslaught. We're here on a hill overlooking Thingwall, the Viking Thing. What is a Viking Thing? Well, Mark, Thing is Old Norse for assembly or parliament. And across the road from here, this is, would you believe, one of the most significant historical sites on Wirral and possibly even the, the northwest because this is where the, the Wirral Norsemen had the uh, parliament. This thing would have uh, served the Scandinavian community on Wirral back in uh, the 10th century and possibly the 11th century. And it would have met uh, probably once, once a year, maybe twice a year to discuss policy, law and other things. The other big thing, big emergency, if it did occur on Wirral, would have been the, the Battle of Brunenborough when uh, an invading uh, Viking army coming from uh, Ireland with Scottish allies took on the uh, uh, English army led by King Athelstan and that certainly would have been of great concern to the locals. The Anglo-Saxon chronicles tell of one of the most ferocious battles ever fought on English soil at a place called Brummenburg, possibly modern-day Bromburg. Historians hotly debate exactly where it took place, but Stephen Harding and his team are convinced it was fought here. So at the moment this place looks very idyllic. It's got its pond with its willow and its mowed grass and its kept hedges. Why would this location be the battle site? Why here? This would seem to fit the bill more than others because uh, uh, Non-contemporary records now uh, record how the battle took place on some heathland uh, near some, some woods. This is actually from uh, Egil's saga. Right. And uh, historically, this is the area of heath. It's called Bevington Heath. And uh, on the far side there, you've got uh, Stoughton Woods. And uh, So if I was a, a gambling man choosing an area on Wirral where the battle would have taken place, this would have been... Uh, my choice. At the Battle of Brunnenburg, the fate of scores of Viking warriors was decided in a single day. Weapons expert Mike Lodes describes how the opposing forces squared up. The Saxon army of King Athelstan and the mostly Viking alliance of King Olaf were very similar type of troops. By the 10th century, the male Burney has become bigger. It's become what's known as the Hoburg, and it's got a male coif giving extra protection to the head. It's got the Aventail, which is this extra bit of mail here, either to give reinforcement to the chest or to be worn to protect the throat. Both armies are still fighting with shields, fighting in the shield wall, and they're using swords, and they're using spears. Whoa! There's a number of ways you can get through that. One way is they devised all sorts of tactics. They could do a thing called the Svinfilking, which is the boar snout. So you would get a wedge of men coming into a snout to punch right through and make a hole in the enemy lines. Or if they were outnumbered, you would get the forceps where they would try and encircle and outflank. But another way of doing it 
was to send out a blood squad with their great Dane axes. It's an extraordinarily versatile weapon that can be used with great fluidity. The Battle of Brunnenberg was fought relentlessly for nearly 10 miles across the Wirral. The killing fields flowed with blood from sunrise to sunset. Mounted Saxon warriors pursued the fleeing Viking forces and mercilessly felled them from behind as they tried to escape. It was carnage. So was that the end of Vikings on the Wirral? Well, probably not. Recent DNA analysis of 50 men from old rural families demonstrated that genetic links with Viking settlers. Today, that Viking influence still echoes in the rural landscape and its people. So the Vikings, in effect, are still here today? Absolutely, Mark. So watch out. <laughs>